Good morning, or afternoon, or evening, whatever. My name is Jim Nicholson, and for those of you who don't know me, I used to be an instructor at Ali USCB. Then we moved to the upstate, and now I occasionally teach at Ali USCB, but most of my instruction is done at the Ali in Furman University, where my wife and I are members, and also uh, some at Wofford and at Clemson. I say usually, but right now I'm not teaching anywhere because everything's closed. So I thought that I would try doing this online. It's the first time I've ever done it. Maybe a little rough, but I guess I'll get better. So, what we're going to do today is talk about chefs as celebrities. And this is part of a nine-part course that I did at Furman a year ago. And it's packaged two parts for Ali at USCB. Chef as celebrity, and then the other side of the coin would be the critics of chefs. So it's a two-part course, and I'm doing the first part today. So, we'll start off with two familiar names. First is Julia Child, and I've always liked Julia Child's approach to diet food. She said the only time to eat diet food is while you're waiting for the steak to cook. And the other name is James Beard. And James Beard once said, a gourmet who thinks of calories is like a tart who looks at her watch. All right, well, before we go any further, let's give a definition to a chef. A chef is a professional cook, typically the chief cook in a restaurant or a hotel. Versus a cook. Now, if you're a chef, you probably have a culinary degree, or you've trained under a chef and have moved up in the ranks. If you're a cook, you work in a home kitchen, or you're just starting out at the bottom of the restaurant totem pole. And we'll talk about positions in a chef in a uh, restaurant a little bit later. Now, Jayla Lawson once said, A chef means a degree of professionalism either because you've got the qualification or because you've worked in a restaurant kitchen. I have done neither. Or she would say, I have done neither. My only qualification is in medieval modern languages at Oxford. A chef means that in some sense you are professional. And I feel like I am a professional amateur. Well, then there's Auguste Escoffier, who said, A cook is a man with a can opener. A chef is an artist. So we've defined the term chef very precisely. But we'll use the term chef very loosely. Some of you might not consider some of the people we talk about in this class as chefs. Some of them don't even consider themselves chefs. But when we talk about celebrity chefs, all bets are off. And when I was young, it was a big treat for us, my family back in Brooklyn, to go to the Seaview Diner. And the Seaview Diner, I'm sure, had a cook, and he probably looked something like this. As a matter of fact, if I had seen a cook that looked something like this at the Seaview Diner, I probably would have thought he was a doctor or a sea captain. All right, well, the idea of a celebrity chef is not a new one. Many think that Antonin Carême was the first celebrity chef. He cooked for royalty in France. More in our time, people might look at Julia Child as being the first celebrity chef. But of course, Julia always maintained that she was not a chef at all. The only reason that her show was called The French Chef was because it was short enough to fit into the TV listings for WGBH in Boston. No, my view is that this man was America's first celebrity chef, and his name was Pierre Franey, executive chef at Le Pavillon in New York. Well, who was Pierre Franey? For that, we have to go back to 1939. Now, we mentioned Julia Child and James Beard a few minutes ago. Well, Julia Child, back in 1939, was a spy. She worked for, she really was. She worked for the OSS, 
and she worked through the war for the OSS someplace in Southeast Asia. James Beard was in New York. But basically, he was, at that time, a failed actor. But something did happen in 1939 that affects our story, and that was the 1939 World's Fair. And arriving on the Normandy, in New York Harbor in 1939, were a number of people who are going to figure quite prominently here. A fellow by the name of Jean Durand, and a fellow by the name of Henri Soule. And they were here, that's Henri Soule right there, they were here along with a young commie chef, and we'll talk about what a commie chef is later, named Pierre Freny. And they were to staff, open and staff, the French Pavilion Restaurant at the 1939 World's Fair. Here's some pictures of the restaurant from 1939, a bit before my time. Okay. And it was quite an elegant place. As you can see. And it was immensely popular. The fair was popular and the French restaurant was popular. So, what happened was the war started. Now the fair was in two parts, in 1939 and in 1940. The French made a decision to reopen the fair in 1940, because at that time, not a lot was going on in the war in 1940 in France. It was the, the, the uh, quiet war, the dummy war, I think they called it. So they reopened again. But then the war started in earnest, and a lot of the chefs went back to France and joined the service. And a lot of them stayed in New York. But once the fair closed, they had no place to go. So... Henri Soule decided he was going to open a restaurant. And he was going to open a restaurant and call it Le Pavilion in a nod to the Pavilion restaurant at the World's Fair. Now, New York is an untapped market for fine French cuisine. And the food at Le Pavilion was an immediate hit. And the service was an immediate hit. And even with the war in Europe and our coming involvement in the war, it was the place to dine in New York City, if you could afford it. This was at a time when Henri Soule was comping meals for celebrities and spending lavishly on the front of the house, the part where the public are allowed. And Soule felt that his head chef, who was the young commie chef we talked about a few minutes ago by the name of P.F. Rainey, by this time he was the head chef. He felt that the head chef would not leave, even though he was underpaying the staff and spending money on the front of the house. To dine at Le Pavilion was an experience. To work at Le Pavilion was not so much an experience because you were underpaid. But as I said, this restaurant was an immediate success. It had an unrivaled menu. Nobody in New York had a rent menu like Le Pavilion. And Pierre Franey was a very talented man. His sous chef was a fellow whose name you may recognize, Jacques Pepin. We'll talk about him a little bit later. So as I said, Soule felt that Franey would not leave, but Franey wanted more money for his staff. Soule said, no, can't afford to pay you. So what did Soule do? What did Franey do? He walked out. As the French said, say, le brigade sauté. The brigade exploded. Soule walks out and the rest of the staff want to follow well, what happened? Pepin was the one who was orchestrating this, and he got a visit one day from two rather large Italian gentlemen from Local 89 of the Restaurant Employees Union, who basically tossed them up against the wall 
and told him, you're not leaving. Well, that changed his mind fairly quickly, but as he said, I didn't think they came to the restaurant to sample Le Poulet Pavillon, but there was no way they could force us to work overtime, he reasoned, or make us work if we were sick, and there was no way they could prevent us from leaving one by one, and that's what we did. So that makes Pierre Freni the first executive chef that and the first celebrity chef, in my opinion, because of the effect that it had. The chef quits, the restaurant closes, and it makes the newspapers. When everybody left, all of a sudden, Soule did not have enough people to keep the menu up the way it should have been kept. The New York Times, a fellow by the name of Craig Claiborne, who we will mention in the next class, writes an article, Restaurant Men Simmer and the Menu goes to pot. Le Pavillon shut in a Gallic peak. Chef walks out and feud over hours and seven members of staff follow him. Restaurant remained closed for several months. It eventually reopens, but it was never the same again. All right. Before we begin again, we need to talk about restaurants. And a restaurant is a dangerous place. It's very rare that somebody gets through a shift with clothes as white as this. So, all right, let's discuss restaurants. They are dangerous places. There's open fires, sharp knives, slippery floors, dangerous equipment, and even more than that, tempers. So you got to be on your toes when you're in a kitchen. And a kitchen has got to be a place of structure. And if a kitchen doesn't have structure, it doesn't succeed for very long. So let's look at the typical structure of a typical restaurant. Now, most restaurants follow the... Uh, Escoffier hierarchy. And we'll talk about that in a couple of seconds. But the first thing is the restaurants are divided into the front of the house and the back of the house. Now the front of the house is every place where a customer is allowed. And that includes the bathrooms. So if a customer can go there, it's considered front of the house. The back of the house is everything else. It would be the kitchens, the offices, the coolers, the trash, the grease pit, anything it would be considered back of the house if a customer can't go there. Okay, and the center of a kitchen is the line. It's where the cooks, you've heard the expression, the line or line cooks. This is where they work, where they do their work of putting the meals together. It consists of a bunch of stovetops. Okay, and then there's a thing that's called the pass. You've heard that if you watch all these cooking shows. You've heard about working the pass. Well, the pass is where all the food that the line cooks prepare go to be inspected by the chef, the head chef, who stands between the line and the pass. And all the food that goes out to the dining room goes across the pass. And all the food that might come back into the dining room, because something is not up to standards, goes across the pass. And the chef is positioned between the two. And he expedites the food. Expedites. He's the one who makes sure that stuff goes out and it meets his expectations. And if something comes back, the chef looks at it, figures out who screwed up, and that person catches holy hell. Now in a large kitchen that follows that Escoffier Brigade model, there might be an executive chef in charge. Okay, now he does little, if any, of the cooking. And he may also be overseeing other restaurants, not just the one that he's physically located in. Below him would be the head chef. Okay, now if you use a naval analogy, the executive chef could be the admiral. And he has more than one ship in his fleet. When he 
is in a particular restaurant or when the Admiral's on a particular ship, that's the flagship. So the flagship restaurant would be the one where the executive chef was. Okay, the head chef works for the executive chef. Okay. Now, the head chef is more like the captain of a ship. Now, he might not be expected to go down with the restaurant if it sinks. But a poor head chef can easily sink a restaurant. Okay, under the chef, the head chef, is the sous chef, his assistant, or, or her assistant. And there may be more than one sous chef in a restaurant. In fact, there usually are more than one sous chef in a restaurant. Because a restaurant is open from very early in the day to very late at night. Nobody's going to work those kind of hours. So you usually have an opening sous chef and a closing sous chef. And they, their shifts will probably overlap a bit. And there might be three or more in a larger restaurant. Directly below the sous chef, you have the other chefs. The chefs de partie. The line cooks, the station chefs. Okay, these are these are lead cooks who are actually preparing your food, and they usually have the most experience. Typically older than some of the other people lower on the rung. They're usually just one step removed from management, and if they should wish to move up, they can. They might have to go to a different restaurant, but they're in a position where they have enough experience that they could move up to, to at least to sous chef. Now, these chefs have different jobs. You'll have the boucher, the poisonneur, poisonné, the uh, patisserie, rotisserie, all these people who cook various different types of food. So you'll have the butcher, the fish chef, the grill chef, the vegetable chef, so on. The vegetable chef is actually a very, very uh, challenging position. If you look at it, it's, it's uh, outlined it in yellow. It's the entre Um Most components on a typical plate are touched at some point by the vegetable chef. And the average vegetable chef, entre metier, is used to handling 15 to 20 separate pans of food at any one time. Now, the next level down are the commie chefs, the kitchen porters. Well, I put them all together, but let's talk about the commie chefs first. They're junior members of staff, and they're learning. They're learning a specific section, and they're often, pe often people who are, have just recently completed or are, are completing uh, formal culinary training. And they're tasked with rudimentary tasks in the kitchen, such as food prep, salad washing, potato peeling, cleaning. Now, because I'm running out of room on the page, I've also included the kitchen porters who carry things from place to place and the dishwashers or escuyers. I mean, I pronounced that correctly, but the dishwashers. I love the name for the head dishwasher. He's called the chef plongeur. Plongeur in French can also mean scuba diver. So, the head Dishwasher is a scuba diver. And that name Esculier, Esculieri, comes from Esculier or scullery, which is a small room adjoining a kitchen in which the dishwashing and the other chores are done. Now, waiters are considered front of the house, but there's another category called back waiters. And these are waiters who take the food from the kitchen out to the waiter. So if you have been in a restaurant and you are waited on to give your order to one fellow or one young lady, and then somebody else serves you your food, that's a case of the back waiter coming out and bringing your food at the restaurant. Quite often, the back waiter will hand the food off to the waiter and the waiter will come to you. So that will be the only person that you interact with. But increasingly in restaurants, the back waiters are also coming out with food. And the back waiters are a very, very important part as far as the chef and the staff in the back are concerned, because they can tip off the chef and the other cooks as to what's going on in the restaurant. Are people happy? Are they upset? Is the restaurant suddenly filling up? That means the kitchen is going to get slammed. 
or is it starting to empty out, which means they can start shutting things down and maybe get home in a reasonable hour. So the back waiters can be the chef's best friend. Typical plan of a kitchen looks something like this. Uh, of course, all restaurants will differ, but uh, if you look at this, you in a large restaurant, you'll have virtually all of those various positions. This is a busy restaurant. We'll look at a couple of restaurants here. So just watch. Now we mentioned line cooks a few minutes ago. Here's a short video that shows what the life of a line cook is like. And it's looking at a specific line cook. And this fellow, Paul Gerard, for some reason, decided to work three shifts in a row. And we're catching him, I think, on his third shift. Now, there are two men talking about him who you will probably recognize, especially if you have any familiarity with the world of food at all. Who is this guy? He called me out of the blue. He said, put me on a line right now. What's wrong with him? I mean, there's something strange about this guy. He's got a regular job. After my day job, I want to go home. This guy wants to cook. The guy's just like an absolute animal. This is his thing. Yeah. He's I, just a degenerate, a degenerate line dog. Uh, it's like he has something to prove. What's he doing back there? Is he good? He's, he's holding it down. He's holding his own. Hitting your stomach anytime you're in a new restaurant. Cook, you know, you, you don't know who the hot shots are, you don't know who the guys are that are gonna help you or hurt you. This is this is what we're waiting to find out. Here we go. Fire pork belly, big on Gino, scallops, scallops, we're picking it up, I get it when I catch the ball. I've seen guys who've worked the station have just an absolutely brutal night. I'm very interested in what's going to happen. Uh, there's definite concerns about, you know, can I hang or will I be able to do it? You know, you can see by the chef's face that, you know, he is not a man to be fucked with. All of you guys are sitting over there playing kissy face, having your own conversation. I'm trying to get the food. Same course, you got three blue things, pecorino, mushroom. 
I have no recollection of what he just told me. Behind that fire, two belly and a duck. Behind that, he's got three pounds of on a skate working. Getting's okay, it's a quick recovery. Go with the bok choy. Good at this, right? right about time the night's over. Oh, I know, you should have three pounds even on a skate working. Now kicking in. things that I loved growing up. Rock and roll and street fighting. With rock and roll, the show must go on. Street fighting, you do not go down. When I'm dropped into a new place, you do know that the rush is coming. It's like every day standing on the train tracks and waiting for the five o'clock to come run you over and you know it's inevitable and it's gonna happen it's gonna happen so when the rush comes and everything is moving 100 miles an hour there's a tendency to want to keep up with that but it's almost like panicking while drowning you just gotta kind of put it out of your brain and say this is, this is what I do uh, that fellow as I said, his name is Paul Gerard, and the latest place he works at, he's got his own restaurant in Hoboken, New Jersey, called the Antique Bar and Bakery. And I kind of hope for his sake, that's his car out front. I was unsure where to start this class about a chef. Should I start at the very beginning, going back to cooking for French royalty. Should I go with the most famous chef or should I go with the best chef? Who can decide who's the best chef? So finally I decided to go with a familiar one and branch out from there. This fellow I'm going to talk about grew up in Leonia, New Jersey. Okay, middle class suburban town, not too far from where I lived in New Jersey. He had a father who was a very adventurous eater and would take his son into New York City quite often to sample various ethnic restaurants. Exotic things like sushi, which in 1970 was somewhat exotic. His first job in the restaurant industry was working in a bar restaurant in Provincetown, Massachusetts. He was a dishwasher. He had two older brothers. Family didn't have a lot of money, and the two other older brothers had first dibs on money for college. And his parents were very happy when he decided that he didn't want to go to college. What he wanted to do was become a chef, and he wanted to go to the Culinary Institute of America. And somehow they were able to scrape up enough money to send him up to Hyde Park, New York, to attend the Culinary Institute. He also worked as, on the weekends as a line cook in restaurants in New York City. Now, working in a kitchen taught him discipline, but it also exposed him to drugs and drinking, and he developed addictions to both. Of course, I'm talking about Anthony Bourdain. He worked his way up in various kitchens until 1998, when he was named as executive chef at Brasserie Les Halles in New York City. In 1999, he wrote an article entitled, Don't Eat Before Reading This. He showed it to his mother. His mother said, you should send that to the New Yorker magazine. So he did. New Yorker published it. The next day, they called him. And they said, we'd like you to write a book based on your article. And we'll pay you $50,000. And he said, I'm no dummy. I'm dunking french fries at age 44. I'll write the damn book. And he did. 
And that book was Kitchen Confidential, Adventures in the Culinary Underbelly, which burst like a bomb on the culinary scene. And I remember reading it when it first came out. The main thrust of the book was Bourdain's overcoming those addictions and becoming a good chef. Not that he became a Michelin chef, not that he owned his own restaurant, not any of those things, but that he was able to overcome those addictions and become a decent chef at Les Halles. What I liked best about it was the ending chapter. Bourdain is happy just to have survived his younger life. He's content. He says that he didn't think that he would be shipping out on some great clipper ship and roaming the streets of Peshawar. He said, I still had a few moves left in me, and I was content to play them out where I started, New York City, the center of the world. And then his bosses at Les Halles asked him to go to Tokyo to open their new restaurant there, which he was not eager to do. He dreaded the long plane ride, but he ended up going, and he loves Tokyo. And a new chapter in his life opens. And it leads to these television shows. Cook's Tour, No Reservations, The Layover, Parts Unknown. He becomes so famous that he's even on The Simpsons. I'm food bad boy Tony Bourdain. There's nowhere I won't go and nothing I won't eat. As long as I'm paid in emeralds and my hotel room has a bidet that shoots warm champagne. It would probably not be too much of a stretch to say that television and celebrity chefs grew up together. We've covered the TV careers of James Beard and Julia Child. Actually, we haven't because that was a in the class that I did up at Furman. But who knows? I may do it here as well. But there were others. There was and is Martin Yan. His show, Yan Can Cook. Debuted in 1978 on PBS, and it's still on today in its current iteration, Yan Can Cook Spice Kitchen. Now here's a very short clip from an early show showing a young Yan. Yeah, I want to make a, what I call a hamburger, Chinese style. One thing that puzzles me is I don't understand why they call ham burger. There's no ham in the darn thing. <laughs> I think the more appropriate should be beef burger. Chinese beef burger. Okay, here, I want to show you exactly what I have here. I have some mushroom, which I'm going to cut this up. Set it aside, put it over here, and chop it up. Set it aside, put it over here. And then, another one. If you want to make it bigger. Wow, big. <laughs> Not only big, you smash the thing. <laughs> wow, this is... <laughs> you haven't seen nothing yet. And then there was The Frugal Gourmet, Jeff Smith. Debuted on PBS in 1983, all the way through 1997, and I'm sure most of you remember him as well. This fellow, Graham Kerr, the Galloping Gourmet. His career started in New Zealand with the New Zealand Broadcasting Company, and he was in. Uh, he was a flight lieutenant, I believe. His first appearance was in 1960. 
He was a hasty replacement for a military aerobics instructor who was supposed to appear on New Zealand, New Zealand Broadcasting Company and broke his ankle, couldn't appear. So they brought in Kerr in his uniform and he demonstrated how to make an omelet. This led to a six episode show called Eggs with Flood, Lieutenant Kerr, or as they would say, Flight Lieutenant Kerr. And that led to a series called The Graham Kerr Show. Here's a clip from the original show. Thank you very much for coming along, first of all, and thank you for watching. Now, I don't really remember way back in, when, when was it, May, um, we did have a program which was called, um, for, for a choice of a better... That's an old clip. Well, it proved very popular, and what happens is that the Fremantle Television Network in Australia picks up the show, and they develop, eventually, a show for the United States. And here's a short clip from that. sideburns like that. His freewheeling style was developed for him by his wife, Trina, which was good because it really needed it. Interesting aside here, his manager was a guy named Harry Miller. And Harry Miller worked out an endorsement deal with a company called Union Carbide for a new product. All Graham had to do was to make a few commercials pose for a few photos, and use the product on his show. In return, instead of getting a flat fee, he would get a half cent on every unit sold. Kara was unconvinced that the product would catch on, and he refused. And he was probably right, because who's ever heard of this product? Now you saw the opening clip, which opened with him leaping over a chair. I think he missed it a couple of times. And people would say, oh, that's because he drank so much wine. He drank more wine on the show than Julia Child did. It's no wonder he tripped over the chair. Well, the thing was that he didn't drink very much wine on the show at all. Okay, what was going on was that every time it was time for a commercial break, he would lift the glass of wine to his lips, and when, the lip, when it touched his lips, the cameras would cut away for the commercial. And then when it was time to come back, he put the glass back up and then put it down. So it looked like he was drinking constantly. But he actually drank very little on the show. So there were chefs on TV, although mostly on public broadcasting. There was very little exposure unless one of them came on for maybe a 67, 60 minute, a 60 second or two minute bit on something like Good Morning America. Okay, but uh, normally they were confined to PBS. But that was about to change in 1993 when New York got hit with what it didn't know that it needed, food all day long on the Food Network. Now, we should have seen it coming. At the time, there were 25 to 30 cable channels. Technology was coming that would soon offer 100, 500 channels. Sports, music, news, all had their own channels. Why not food? The Food Network started with an idea in Providence, Rhode Island, with some initial invest involvement from the culinary school there, Johnson and Wales. And their first breakout star was a fellow by the name of Emeril Lagasse. Now, he, had, he, he actually came from the New Providence area, but he was down in New Orleans where he had a restaurant. 
They were undecided about Emerald at first. They weren't sure whether they should have a guy named Jasper White, who was big at the time on the show, or whether they should have Emerald. So they were trying to make the decision, and one of the people making the decisions happened to ask a young assistant what she thought of the two men, Jasper White or Emerald. And she said, Emerald. He's a hunk, isn't he? So Emerald was in and Jasper was out. And Emerald was in for 15 years. People could be forgiven for thinking that it was the Emerald Network. His Emerald live show was abruptly canceled in 2007 when the network wanted to move in a different direction. Reality programming, which is pretty much what it is today. Somehow, Emerald on Iron Chef was not a good fit. It was actually proposed to him. They said, what about trying Iron Chef, this new show we're starting? And he says, well, what about Platinum Chef? You thought of that? And he walked out. But he had a whole bunch of shows on there. It was the Emerald Lagasse show, The Essence of Emerald, Emerald Live, Emerald's Table. His first show was called How to Boil Water. And they quickly figured out he was overqualified for that show, so they fired him from that show and developed another one for him. You ever wonder why he says BAM all the time? Well, in the early days, the hectic filming schedule had the cameraman working long hours, and that BAM was designed to wake them up. Now, as Food Network changed its focus, they developed a whole new network of stars. Here were a few of the bigger names that either appeared on Food Network or were developed on Food Network. And some are more chefs than others. Some are not chefs at all. Alton Brown, for example, is not a chef. Never claimed to be one. Some of them may spend more time in the makeup room than they do in the kitchen. Now, we're spending a lot of time on the Food Network here. But there were other cable channels that dealt heavily into food, especially when the reality TV era began. Bravo was right there at the beginning with its develop development of Top Chef in 2006. The latest iteration of Top Chef just started two nights ago, a few nights ago. Not sure when you're watching this. And then there were a slew of spin-offs such as Top Chef Masters and Top Chef Just Desserts and Top Chef Junior and various international adaptations. All different countries. To date, 22 other countries outside the United States have a Top Chef program. And then Fox gets into the act by bringing in Gordon Ramsay. More about him a little bit later. Sometimes I think that Gordon has 22 different shows in the U.S. alone. Some of them not even having to do with restaurants, like Hotel Hell. Now, some caveats about celebrity chefs. Just because they have their own show doesn't mean that they know anything about cooking. And it's not always their own recipes. Some outsource their recipes or hire recipe writers. And that's not always a bad thing. Sometimes a good writer can make a chef more accessible to the home cook. After all, it's basically what Julia Child did in The French Chef. She simplified and adapted French recipes for an American audience. And these days, a good chef, good celebrity chef, will give credit where credit is due. And if a cookbook's the result, hopefully the contributing writer will get a credit. Ghost book cook writers like David Joaquin, okay, Mark Vetri's book. Daniel Baloud gives credit to Melissa Clark. And so celebrity chefs will put their name on anything. They've all got their own set of cookware. In fact, it's probably a good idea to take any of their endorsements with a grain of salt, and the pun is intended. Guy Fieri, for example, signed on as a spokesman for Rolaids a few years ago, and he probably would know that. Um, in our next class, we'll talk about reviews of his 
restaurant in New York, Guy's American Kitchen and Bar, uh, which is quite interesting. Probably the worst restaurant review ever written. Then Aaron Sanchez, who you've seen on Gordon Ramsay's shows, advertises Bud Light. Here's, he's from Mexico. He's advertising Bud Light. You might remember that Paula Dean revealed a few years ago that she had been diagnosed with type 2 diabetes. About the same time, she becomes a spokesman, a spokeswoman, for a diabetes drug. Of course, it was later dropped when she got so much bad publicity about it. Anthony Bourdain was particularly brutal about it. He said, thinking of getting into the leg breaking business so I can sell crutches later for a profit. He says, when your signature dish is a hamburger in between a donut and you've been cheerfully selling this stuff knowing all along that you've got type 2 diabetes, it's in bad taste and nothing else. He called her the most dangerous women, woman in America. Now, one additional point about celebrity chefs, if you think you're going to get a five-star meal, you may have another think coming. And we'll talk about that next week when we talk about the review of Guy Fieri's restaurant in New York. But there's really not a significant relationship between celebrity chefs and Michelin stars, for example. And I'm sure that doesn't surprise us. Now, we're talking about all celebrity chefs here, not just Food Network. Mar Masaruro Muramoto of Iron Chef he has a Michelin star. Bobby Flay got a Michelin star for his restaurant in 2008, and then he lost it in 2009. So current holders of Michelin stars that are TV celebrity chefs are pretty hard to think of, with one exception. Gordon Ramsay. He holds 16 of them. Now, as the French call these awards, they don't call them stars, they, they call them macarons. Is he running a restaurant or is he running a patisserie? I don't know. But Gordon's got 16 Michelin stars. Now let's look at Gordon under pressure. This is 1998. It's a younger Gordon Ramsay. And he is about to experience a Michelin review. He's looking for his third Michelin star. Okay. Now you may feel sorry for a few people in this video, but let's watch this. I've sniffed them out and I, I, I think I'm 99% sure they're coming tonight, so yeah, it's all down to us, really. Yeah, what is the importance? Well, there's a great importance, and it's what we wake up in the morning for. It's what we get out of bed at 6.30 in the morning. It's what we go to bed at 2 o'clock in the morning for. Tom, did you lay on the table for Michelin? Did you put the... Did you lay on the table for Michelin? When there's one guy that sits in your dining room and it happens to be the Michelin, then Christ, you know about it in a big way. And that's why I'm so, you know, a little dubious the fact that, you know, we've been looked at it now and it scared me to think that we're under that kind of scrutinization. Two stars is a chef's award. It's a cook's award. You get two stars for cooking. You get three stars for being a cook stroke restaurateur. And now that's what Gordon's turning into. He inspects his cheese board. He takes an interest in the wine cellar. He looks at the flowers. He inspects the waiters. Three stars is all about the package. When they walk into Gordon Ramsay's restaurant, even though they may not see him, they should be able to smell him. It's important not to put the staff on edge because that will have a feel in the dining room. The rest of the staff will be on edge. They'll be slightly nervous and be waiting for a mistake to happen. So. Um, You've got to control it and make your staff feel relaxed and composed uh, on dealing with such a big occasion. One minute from now, concentrate you. We're just kind of f up for everybody here. Yes, One minute from now, two of in. We you know this is for? Yes, so wake up, what's that there? What's that for? I don't give a f about that. Yes, concentrate on keeping your job. Oh, come on, donkey. Who's that? Get a grip, you are. Yeah, are you in a daze, you? Are you in a daze?
Dan, you know, the most experienced person on the pass, hey, hey, still stand there like a you know. Who do you actually, I mean, how good do you actually think you are? Bottom line. What, well, how good do you actually think you are? Bottom line, seriously. Do you think you're No, you don't. Well, that was probably the toughest ever dinner I'll possibly cook, I suppose. Um, that was supposed to be the president of the Michelin guys. And uh, fine, it's very clever, they use false names, and that's what we like about them, because they're completely incognito, but John Claude recognised them from two years ago, which was important. They put me to the test in a big way, and uh, let's wait and see in three months' time. Now, you may feel sorry for the young man who took the brunt of Gordon's anger during the service. But listen to Marco Pierre White, who was Gordon's mentor, explain the standards in a Michelin-starred restaurant. When Gordon worked for me, he realized that the standards were the most important. And they, Gordon has adopted that. And in his kitchen, if you see, as you must have done many times, stood in his kitchen and watched him conduct a service, he doesn't let anything go which doesn't meet the standard which is required. Gordon has a duty to his clients to deliver a standard. People walk through those doors wanting dreams to come true, and that's what it's all about. Now, if you were paying $400 for a meal at a restaurant, I'm not sure you'd be very satisfied if you had overcooked artichokes either. Fast forward to the release of the next Michelin Guide, Ramsey doesn't get the third star that he had hoped for. However, three years later he does for restaurant Gordon Ramsay in London, and he's never lost it. Now Tom Colicchio doesn't really think very much of Ramsey's treatment of his staff. I would never treat a member of my staff in that way. But then Tom Colicchio doesn't have any Michelin stars, and Gordon has got 16. So who's right? Who's wrong? I don't know. So is Gordon Ramsay the meanest, toughest chef out there? Not by a long shot. I can name about six or seven celebrity chefs who are even harder to work with than Gordon Ramsay. And how about this guy? Somebody who made Gordon Ramsay break out in tears in a kitchen. Yes, Marco Pierre White. Who's ready to become a chef? First thing, you don't need to go to culinary school. Going to culinary school doesn't make a better chef out of somebody. What it does do is make you a more informed chef, which is also very important. But not everyone goes. Let's see who did go and who didn't. Anthony Bourdain did go. We talked about that before. He went to the Culinary Institute of America. Gordon Ramsay never went to culinary school. He didn't even want to become a cook. He wanted to become a professional footballer. And he had a tryout and a short stint with Glasgow Rangers until he blew out his knee and had to retire from football at a very young age. He then went to school and got a degree in hotel management, not cooking. Let's look at some others. Emeril Lagasse went to culinary school. Ina Garten didn't. Julia Child went to culinary school. In fact, she even started her own culinary school. Tom Colicchio did not. Michael Simon went to culinary school. Martha Stewart did not. Bobby Flay went. Reed Drummond didn't. Alton Brown did. Lydia Bastianich did not. So, it's a toss-up. You either go or you don't. It doesn't matter. Uh, you, you have a good chance of becoming a TV personality star. Either way. Now, if you're thinking of a second career and you don't want to go to culinary school, here's the options for you. Get a job as a line cook and work your way up. The problem with that is line cooking is a young man's job. Remember Paul Girard? Young man. Look at the pressures that he was under. Okay, it's not a young man or a young woman's job. 
you don't see too many 50 to 60 to 70 year old line cooks. But if you choose culinary school, your chances are also not good. Okay? Take the years in school and the years you need to prove yourself in the kitchen working the line anyway, you're still too old. Now, if you really love food and are willing to forego being a chef, culinary school could land you a job in some area of the culinary world. Okay? You could take cooking classes. There's a cooking class at the Ollie Furman Kitchen. Okay, now down in USCB, Ollie, you've got an even bigger kitchen and you've got a bar. I use these two pictures to make the people at Furman really jealous. So, is it a restaurant job or culinary school? What are you going to do? If you decide to go to culinary school, where do you go? Well, here's the top five schools in the United States. Now, opinions vary as to which is better. Johnson & Wales is certainly the biggest. Probably, probably the best might be the Code and Blue uh, or the Culinary Institute of America. It depends on who you ask. But we're going to look at one. We're going to look at the Culinary Institute of America. Okay? Now, most cooking schools have a, an option. You can go for two years or four years. The two-year option will give you a, um, a degree in uh, culinary science. And the four-year option, tax on hotel management. So you could do that. And there are hundreds and hundreds of programs in the United States. Okay. But I'm going to focus on the Culinary Institute of America for personal reasons. My wife Susan and I have visited it. We've toured it. We've even eaten in a couple of the restaurants. Culinary Institute of America, the other CIA, as they call it. It was originally established in 1946 by Francis Roth and Catherine Engel. It was intended, it was, it was established in New Haven in 1946. It was intended to train returning GIs as cooks. Now, the thing is, after the war, war with things the way they were in Europe, there weren't French chefs and other chefs coming to the United States. So GIs coming back had the opportunity to get in, sort of like on the ground floor, you might say, as a chef, and they could go to the school and learn a trade. First graduating class was uh, 44 men and one woman. You see more than one woman in, woman in there, but you've also got Francis Roth and Catherine Angle and, and a secretary in the picture. Now, this year, the CAA announced that the majority of its students were female. And that was a, for the first time in its 71-year history. The school had trouble getting accreditation from the government at first. The reason, the government considered that it was a trade school, and they were leery about offering accreditation to a school where its students were eating seven course meals every day. But of course they were cooking and it was part, it was their homework. So it was part of their training. The school grew and it needed to expand so a new location was found and they moved to New York, to Hyde Park. And perhaps in keeping with the idea of food as religion, the school that they purchased in 1972 was a former Jesuit Academy in the Hudson Valley. Now you can go there and you can take a tour for six dollars. You can eat there. You can eat at the American Bounty Restaurant. You'll need a reservation. You can eat at the Ristorante Caterina de Medici. You'll need a reservation. You can eat at the Apple Pie Bakery Cafe. You will not need a reservation normally. When I went there with Susan, the first time we went, in fact, all the times we went, we, we ate a couple of different restaurants, but we ate at the Le Scoffier Room at the CIA, and this was fine French dining. Now, what happened, and it, was, you know, it had its emphasis on fine French dining and the mother sauces and painstaking preparation and service and so on, the place that Anthony Bourdain called his boot camp from hell. But the CIA felt that its time had passed and nobody wanted those heavy sauces anymore. So they closed it and they renovated it and they reopened it as the Bocuse 
restaurant at the CIA. It was named in honor of the French, famous French chef Paul Bocuse, who died in 2008. But this was named for him before he died. I don't know if he ever visited it or not. But, and I haven't eaten there. But one thing they've done is they've maintained something from the Escoffier room, which we really liked. It was this big window, which looks out onto the kitchen so you can watch them preparing your food. And one of the times we went there, we sat at that table right by the window, and we were just able to watch them making the food. It was quite, quite a thing. And I hope that the Major D still greets people when, they, when he seats them at the restaurant. He says, welcome to my classroom. And those classrooms, other than the restaurant itself, are quite the thing. They've got 36 classrooms. These are typical classrooms. This is a lecture hall. Uh, we went past there and there was a lecture going on the day. Now, I went to a lecture hall at NYU and it certainly was not anything like this. Most students seem to be awake in the classes. It's fun to walk around being surrounded by students rushing between classes in their to toques and their houndstooth trousers and their clogs. This is a bit dated. Uh, there's a class right here. This is a, uh, they have two locations. They have one in Hyde Park and another one in California in the Napa Valley. This is a bit dated. It's been updated, but this is what a typical class schedule would look like at the at the Institute. So if you ever find yourself in the Northeast, it's well worth a visit. But what about something a little bit closer to home? For that you look to this man, James Beard, and the James Beard Awards. In 2019, the best chef in the Southeast was Mashama Bailey. And I don't know, maybe some of you have eaten at her restaurant at called The Gray in Savannah, Georgia. What's on Martin Luther King Boulevard, Junior Boulevard. There's a couple of pictures of her. And then there was the Outstanding Chef Nationwide 2019, Ashley Christensen. She's only about four hours away from you in Poole's Diner in Raleigh, North Carolina. It doesn't look like much. Outstanding Chef Nationwide 2019. And then there's this one. Best, nominee for Best Restaurant 2020. Just a top skip and a jump away from Ali. Actually, my Ali, not yours. The Oak Hill Cafe and Farm in Greenville. We haven't eaten there yet, and we probably can't. Now we can't because they're all closed. But uh, when we get through all this, I'm going to go there and eat. We saw it. We were going up to Ali every day. We saw this cafe, and we said, you know, cafe. It's just another restaurant. Maybe we'll go eat there sometime. And then I found out that they were nominated as the best new restaurant in 2020. So definitely on my to-do list. Now I'm going to show you a few other restaurants, but you're going to have to come up to Greenville to see them because I'm really not currently tuned in to what's the best restaurants in the low country. But they're much closer to me. There's Husk in Greenville, and that uh, uh, is related to the Husk that's in Charles Charleston. You may have eaten, eaten there. We have a brand new one. In West Greenville is the hot new place in Greenville. It's just west of the city. It's redeveloping, being gentrified. There's a place called the Anchorage, which was re recently written up in the New York Times. Sobeys, anybody who's ever visited downtown Greenville would, 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 have, would remember Sobeys. Lazy Goat, which is right on the river. Pomegranate, uh, Larkins as well. Uh, I don't know if I have a picture of Larkins and so on. So there's a lot of good places to eat in Greenville. I'm sure there's a lot of good places to eat down here too. I remember some really good ones. Now, just to close it all off, if any of you think that you're a better cook than any of the chefs, at those restaurants, then what are you waiting for? All right, next week, I think it'll be next week when I get it done, 
we're going to talk about the other side of the coin, critics. Okay. Thanks very much. Hope we all get through this okay. And uh, see you next week.